and sisters, let's stand as we begin our worship together. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be you, Savior, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are given. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify in your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. 
Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good to be with you all this uh, evening. Seems like it's us and the part of Golden. <laughs> so, uh, we actually had a funeral at 2 o'clock, and they also joined us for the funeral, so it was good. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thanks to Gwen for being here today. Uh, as some of you may have heard, Dennis got COVID uh, last, late last week, early this week, and so he's home, he's doing fine. If we would let him, he would come in, but of course, that we shouldn't do. So he says hello with uh, a lot of angst, because he loves being with you. Um, and pray for Dean. Uh, Dean is our normal Saturday organist, many of you know him. He is uh, doing well enough that right now he's on vacation in Hawaii to get some rest much needed and much hoped for to pray for him to his soul really to be restored while he's doing that he continues on his um they don't call it experimental treatment what they call it clinical trial and it is doing uh wonders for him so he he still fights a little sickness around uh, basically heavy chemo and they will up since he's doing so well they will up his doses in the weeks to come when he gets back uh, but he's very grateful for what god is providing right now and he also sends his hellos. I got to spend some good time with him earlier this week. Uh, today is Pocket Change Saturday, in fact, which is also Pocket Change Sunday. And uh, Calvary has a scholarship fund in memory of Mike Keckler's mom, Marilyn. He'll tell you all about her, but she's somebody who loved education and really liked it and was effective at encouraging people through that. If you'd like to take some of that loose change in your pocket, and uh, Mike will take that from you, lighten your pocket, so to speak, and uh, he'll put it to good use in that scholarship fund. He can tell you much more about that. Mike, thanks for doing that. Uh, we continue to move forward with Calvary Kids Bible Time and Calvary Kids during our Sunday morning activities, as well as youth group at 930. If you've got children and youth, I encourage you to come and join with those. Um, that happens during the 930 and at 10, 930 service and at 1045 each Sunday. And then tomorrow, uh, following the 9.30 Great Hall service, so about 10.45, a group will be gathering together to prepare a meal for those who are in safe outdoor space parking. Uh, that meal is prepared lovingly by your hand and others, and then later on in the Sunday afternoon delivered, we join with other churches and organizations to provide uh, a meal for those who are in this um, kind of parking lot that has specific housing for those who are unhomed, unhoused at this time. If you have any more questions about that, please see me. And then finally, I would encourage you to join with us in uh, Philip Yancey's uh, great book and study that goes with us, goes with it called Vanishing Grace. That's at 1045 in Community Room 1. Uh, Sarah Kirk was going to say something about it. Are well, you? I'm, I'm allowed to say something. Yeah, please do. So, um, and again, this is, it, it can be as intense as you want or as well as you can put it in the video series. And then we just have a discussion about what we just saw. So if you want to read the book, that's great. But if you want to just kind of, it's a good way to interact with other people, get to know them, and we have fun. Great. Thanks for uh, helping. Well, we made an offer comes last week. So yeah. So Nancy will be there to speak with us that time. Thanks for uh, helping lead this part of the ministry of Calvary. We love to pray with those who have birthdays and anniversaries. Does anyone have one today or this week? If so, will you stand and tell us your name and about your birthday? In me in our room? Okay, we have some who are not uh, here tonight, might be with us tomorrow. Uh, please join me in praying for Susan Jeffries, Morgan Lorenz, Lawrence Nelson, and Mary Wilson, all have birthdays tomorrow. Jack Callahan, who's nine, and Anna Annabelle Cuthbert, who's five. Corey Pierce, Ron Carley, Taylor, and Annie Weekly, who's 14, all on Monday. A lot of birthdays over this week. Diana Packard, who uh, has a birthday on Tuesday. Jen House, Jack Jones, and Zoe Jones, both turning 14. Andy Rave Gum, Rave Gum and Brenda Walls have birthdays on Thursday. Aspen Day turns 18 on Friday, along with Pete Dole and Janice Harper, who turns 6. And then Saturday, Catherine Gardner is celebrating a, nursery, uh, a birthday. Will you join with me in praying for them? Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when the spirit is sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall, and in their hearts may your peace which passes understanding abide all the days of their lives, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Similarly, we want to pray for those who have 
wedding anniversaries. You have an anniversary today or this week. Will you stand and let us know your names about your anniversary? Okay, we know of a couple in the congregation, or one in the country congregation, that's Peter and Becky Buckley. Peter and Becky Buckley, who, tur who turned 19, who are celebrating 19 years uh, on Tuesday. Join with me in praying for them. O oh, gracious and ever-living God, you have created us male and female in your image. Look mercifully upon this man and this woman who come to you seeking your life with their grace, that with true fidelity and steadfast love they may honor and keep the promises and vows they have made through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Lord, open our lips. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, let us go. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. The army of the king of Babylon was then besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah, the prophet, was confined in the courtyard of the guard in the royal palace of Judah. Now Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned him there. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of Shalom, your uncle is going to come to you and say, Buy my field at Anathoth, because as nearest relative, it is your right and duty to buy it. Then, just as the Lord had said, my cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the guard and said, Buy my field at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. Since it is your right to redeem it and possess it, buy it for yourself. I knew that this was the word of the Lord, so I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out for him seventeen shekels of silver. I signed and sealed the deed, had it witnessed, and weighed out the silver on the scales. I took the deed of purchase, a sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, as well as the unsealed copy, and I gave it, gave this deed to Baruch, the son of Nariah, the son of Mahia. In the presence of my cousin Hanamel and other witnesses who had signed the deed, and of all the Jews sitting in the courtyard of the guard. In their presence, I gave Baruch these instructions. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Take these documents, both the sealed and the unsealed copies of the deed of purchase, and put them in a clay jar so they will last a long time. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please join in saying today's song. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall say to the Lord, You are my life, my stronghold, my God, my God in whom I put my trust. He shall deliver you in the snare of the hunter from the deadly pestilence. He shall, shall cover you with his wings, and you shall find refuge under his wings. wings. His, his faithfulness shall be a shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of any terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, of the, the plagues and stalks of the darkness, nor the sickness that lays waste to any day. Because he is bound to be in love, therefore I deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. He, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I am with him in trouble. 
I will rest with him and bring him to honor. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. A reading from the letter of Paul to the uh, from the first letter of Paul to Timothy. <clears throat> but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, men of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made a good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and lives in unapproachable life, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of a life that is truly life. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat which that which fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in cool in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony here in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us there is a great chasm that has been fixed, so that no one who wants to go from here to there cannot, can, nor can anyone cross from over there to us. He answered then, I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will also not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You can be seated. Do you listen to podcasts? There's probably a lot of yeses in this room. I find them helpful a lot. I go to walks most morning, and sometimes that's what I listen to. When I commuted a lot further than I do now, that was my lifeblood. But I was listening to a, a podcast about a month and a half ago, and the guest that this man was interviewing his name is Steph Stevens Davidowitz, and he just wrote a book. It's not a book I've read, so I'm quoting from the podcast, not from the book, called, the book is called, Don't Trust Your Gut, Using Data to Get What You Really Want in Life. Don't Trust Your Gut. Among the statistics, blah, 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 among the statistics that the host and guest talk through is income relative to happiness. How much you earn relative to happiness. The question they asked is, in the U.S., is there a difference in self-perceived, self-reported happiness and how much people earn? Is it happier when it's higher, happier when it's lower? He stated something that probably you and I kind of have in our memory. The prevailing wisdom since the 1980s has been that happiness increases at a modest rate as income goes up, but only up until kind of a certain point, and then it flattens largely out. Uh, back in the 80s, it was $80,000 a year. If we just updated it for um, inflation, it'd be about $150,000 a year, somewhere in that. And that the, the prevailing wisdom is it's just flat past there. It doesn't make out much difference what you make over that. So Mr. Stevens Davidowitz did some research about this question, they looked at a lot of other research that has been done since the 80s. And it paints a slightly different picture. It is that there are kind of three groupings of happiness relative to income. The first level is that those who are barely making it, those who live paycheck to paycheck, or month to month, even day to day, they have relatively a very low self-reported happiness. And even among them, when, when uh, income increased, if it didn't increase enough to solve that kind of day-to-day, paycheck-to-paycheck concern they had, they had, even if income went up, it didn't change their happiness. The next level is when actually there was enough money that it relieved people of that kind of concern of day-to-day, month-to-month. So poverty, not much happiness, but out of poverty, more happiness. But the relative gain is very, very modest. Those who are in not poverty are only a little bit happier around money than the rest. So that reality of not much happier, that stays with just a modest increase as income ticks up. 
kicks up to not just $150,000, but past two hundred, dollars past $300,000 a year, past $500,000, past a million, all the way up to about a quarter billion dollars a year, people's happiness is only modestly bigger than those who struggle month to month, week to week. When you get up into where you're functionally a billionaire, that's where things seem to change. And so they did some research. It doesn't go up very much, but it does go up statistically. So they did some research, and what it seems to happen is that when you get to kind of that, that amount of money, you stop doing the activities that are highly correlated to unhappiness. Did you know chores? Number one thing correlated to unhappiness. Should we all say an amen to that? I do, holy cow. Or commuting to work, or caring for kids in such a way that it just takes up all of your time and you never have any time to do other things. Or caring for older parents, all this kind of thing. Struggling with fi family finances, second on the list. So, to be clear, as money increases, there's clearly some self-reported gains in happiness, but only modest, and you have to have a ton of money for it to be just a little bit more than modest. So the book, Don't Trust Your Gut, is about how if we pay attention to what research actually tells us about happiness and not do what our gut tells us, that we should get that higher paid job, we would be happier, for instance, we might actually be able to choose the things that more regularly give us self-reported happiness. So, do you know what the number one factor is for work satisfaction? It's who you work with. So what they suggest is that if everybody paid attention to what makes people happy at work, it's not money, it's not is the job meaningful, it's who you work with and liking them, they would say, if you like the people you're working with, don't change your job. Stay working there, you'll be happy for a lot longer. Well, we all know the truth that this is pointing to. Money does not buy happiness. I kind of think we should say it together. Say it with me. Money does not buy happiness. Darn it. In this life or in the next. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, Jesus had been telling parables of judgment. Judgment against the Pharisees who Luke has said quite clearly are lovers of money. Jesus tells, in what we read today, a prophetic parable about a rich man and a poor man, Lazarus, who both die, and we know what happens. The rich man is ceremoniously buried, ends up in Hades or hell. And the, the poor man, who's the only one given a name, is, is translated, just like Elijah was right into heaven in this story. The rich man knew Lazarus because he lived outside of his gates through many years of his life. And Lazarus didn't desire the rich man's life or money, but only the scraps that fell from his table. The rich man who clearly could afford to share these scraps with Lazarus did not grab them. He took from the abundance that he had and rewarded himself, gave himself all sorts of things in his life. In fact, when dinner was done, his pet dogs got the scraps, and then as they patrolled the fences of his property, they would lick through the fence the poor Lazarus wounds, kind of like dessert. Yeah. Jesus tells us this parable. It's a, it's a continuation of that parable of judgment. The rich man begging from Father Abraham to send Lazarus to just cool the tongue, his tongue with water. And so Jesus puts in the words of a father Abraham, the great reversal. You had your reward on earth. You got the good, but Lazarus did not, so he has good now. Undeterred, the rich man asked Abraham to send Lazarus to his family to warn them. And Abraham, in a final kind of pointed reminder of the, God, the judgment that Jesus is right now giving the Pharisees, says, even as Lazarus or another person came back from the dead, they will not turn from unrighteousness to righteousness. That's not going to happen. It's all there in the law and the prophets. So Jesus is saying, your hard, money-loving hearts, Pharisees who listen to this parable, you are getting your own reward now, 
and your hard hearts are going to make it really unpleasant for you later. As Paul and Timothy, as Paul writes to Timothy, it's the same too. Money does not buy us happiness. It's a truth we love to ignore. Jesus is, of course, throughout his whole ministry, consistent about this. It's harder for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God, but with God, in God, all things are possible. The reality is that there is a catechesis, a training that's happening day in and day out in the world all around us. The pseudo-gospel of the world is telling us that more is better. But it simply isn't true. Social research shows it. You know it. Jesus knows it. God has always known it. When God instructs Adam and Eve to eat of the trees of the garden, he's saying, I'm providing richly for you. And in the middle of that garden was the tree of life, which they could have taken up, Adam and Eve. When our hearts and our minds and our bodies, that's what God was trying to prepare. God was trying to show them how sufficient his grace was for them. So the hundreds of trees were there, but Adam and Eve took the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thinking that they will be like God, not. They and we each have a wound of knowledge, which says that we can manage and figure things out and make life what it's supposed to be on our own. Money does not buy happiness. Do you believe that? If you find yourself, like I unfortunately too often do, thinking that it's true, wishing they were true, it means that wound of knowledge is still in our hearts. And so if and when we do not believe that it's true, it means that we continue to have our minds screwed up by the teaching of the world. Our radar is off, and our hearts and our minds, our gut simply misleads us. It's taking us, when we go down that path, from Jesus. But the good news is the gospel of Jesus is stronger, is better, is more nurturing than the gospel of the world. It's where we find our true heart's homes where we see that we can buy spiritual fields like Jeremiah did in promise, in the promise and faithfulness of God, relying there. For it is in faith that we can please God and God desires to provide for us. He desires to reward us. And his provision that is the guarded life. That is eating from the tree of life. You and I both know that Jesus is not against money. But he knows that the love of it is the root of all kinds of evil. And believers stray to it. And when they do, their reward is all kinds of angst and grief. The opposite of poverty Excuse me, the opposite of love of money isn't poverty, it's the love of God. It's God's love for us and God's love through us. It is this that Paul so strongly suggests to Timothy to not stray from. He says, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good profession, your good confession in the presence of many witnesses, when you came to trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. In the sight of God who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus who testified before Pontius Pilate and made the good confession, I charge you, Paul says to Timothy, to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of the Lord Jesus. Keep your faith in him until he comes. Because when he comes, all glory will be to him. 
God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in inapproachable light, no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and glory forever and ever. Keep your faith where all good and glory is. You and I both know that we are rich men and rich women in this world. Remember that all good comes not from our own effort, but remember that all good comes from God, even the good of some financial resources. What you have is from God. It's from God. You have been entrusted with it. And if you have it, don't do what the rich man of Jesus' parable did and spend your time rewarding yourself as if you made it all happen. It's from God. It's a gift. It's an expression of his watching over you, his kindness. Good things are put in open hands, not in clenching fists. So be it become pleased, comfortable, satisfied, grateful for that which God has given you, if you're not. And then if you're not, be and become imitators of God in Christ. When you see others in need, be it spiritual need, emotional need, be it physical need, be like the Good Samaritan and treat him or her as if you were in their very place and you would want, with the way you would want them to treat you. That's the golden rule, right? That's the rule that brings gold to our hearts and our souls. So be and become imitators of God in Christ with others. And then if you're not, be and become generous. You know, there's fear in this life, and that often stops us from being generous. But our provision, remember, is God's responsibility, not ours. We're to work hard, but not mistake who it comes from. Money does not buy happiness, but, and social statistics say this as well as the scripture, giving it away, giving it away does. Self-reported happiness for people that have learned how to be generous is higher than even those who make $250 million or more dollars a year. Giving it away lays up, for a tre- lays up for us a treasure as a firm foundation for the age to come. So in faith, we are to take hold of the life that is really life. Amen. Let's stand and join together confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified by the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world.
I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Kim, for this gathering, and for the priesthood of all believers. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. We pray that especially in Ukraine, in Iran, other places of great violence. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. We pray for our fellow Americans in Puerto Rico, recovering from a devastating flood, those in India from the same, those in Canada from the same. I ask your prayers for all who seek God for a deeper knowledge of Him. Pray that they may find and be found by Him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Lord, hear the prayers of your people, and what we have asked faithfully, grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have not done now. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let's stand together. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Jesus, Jesus, and the peace of Christ with one another. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name, bring offerings and come into his courts.
with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs> to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive his holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. The last day brings with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we're bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory, forever and ever. Amen.
us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of the body of God. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage, love and serve you, gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand together for the blessing. Go forth into the world of peace, in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Strengthen the faint hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
your calories for the minute see what you